from uh, Exodus chapter 20, uh, excuse me, uh, chapter 19, and a little bit from chapter 20. We're going to be reading most of it, starting at verse 1, uh, but I'll kind of jump around a little bit. While you all are finding Exodus uh, chapter 19, and they're pulling it up on the screen, just want to make sure I honor all the wonderful people um, who, uh, who helped keep this campus and this church going, honor Pastor Jasper for his leadership, honor Pastor Huey for being the senior pastor over all of Restoration Church, um, uh, honor Vaughn for uh, all she does to help with this uh, campus, honor my wife, uh, Kadaja, for all that she does in my life and just being such a dear friend to me. And so that being said, let's go ahead. We're going to read uh, Exodus chapter 1, uh, excuse me, chapter 19, starting at verse 1. And it says, On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. They sent out from uh, Rephidim, the, uh, they, after they sent out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession." Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are, these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord commanded him to speak. And the people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me and speak with, uh, hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Sinai in the sight of all the people. Now we're going to verse 14. It says, after Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. He then said to the people, prepare yourself for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. On the, mount, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it and fired. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the, mountain, uh, sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended on the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain, so Moses went up. Verse 24 says, the Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way to come up to the Lord or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people. And after he went down, Moses and the Lord gave the people the Ten Commandments. And so we get to chapter 20, verse 18. After all the Ten Commandments have been given, this is their response. When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and they heard the trumpet and they saw uh, the smoke in the mountain, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we'll die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that uh, the fear of the Lord and the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud of darkness where God was. In the book of Exodus, in this particular chapter, chapters 19 and 20, we come to this point in the story of the Bible where God is going to make a covenant with the children of Israel. Now, up until this point, God has done some pretty amazing things for them, but they had not yet officially become his covenant people. 
They had not officially become the people who he had made a covenant with. He had delivered them out of Egypt. He sustained them in the wilderness, and he even helped them win a battle in the wilderness. But they had not yet made a covenant with one another. They hadn't really done that yet. It was kind of like they were in the dating phase, you know. They were, they, were, they were together, but they weren't really official. And it's one thing for you to like somebody, but it's a whole other thing for you to marry them. And so at this point, it's kind of like they were dating, but now they were about to make it official. They were about to get married, metaphorically speaking. And in the marriage, uh, the two parties are supposed to meet together at some point, exchange vows, and say, I do. And the vows are basically the terms of the covenant, the terms of the agreement. And no matter what vows you hear, they all basically sound like or say something like, I love you, I'm going to be there for you, and I'm not leaving you. In our story today, Israel and God meet at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they begin to exchange their vows. Now, when Israel meets with God, they make sure to have their clothes washed, they're looking clean. But when God meets with Israel, it's not as simple. You see, this isn't just anyone who is coming onto the scene. This is God Almighty. And you have to understand that God is the most glorious being in all of existence. Glory is, some, is a person's personal significance. It's their splendor. It's their majesty. Your glory and my glory has a weight to it. We can all see it and interact with it. When I walked into the room today, I got a couple of uh, waves and a couple of hugs. You were able to interact with my glory, so to speak. But if President Joe Biden were to enter the room right now, we would have the CIA coming in, we had a secret service, and all kinds of high-ranking officials would be all around this room because he entered it. You can believe that we would feel Joe Biden's presence, who he is, his glory when he entered the room. His glory has a weight to it. Now, that's what happens when human beings enter the scene. But when God enters the scene, the God of all creation, when he enters the scene, all of creation bends and sways at his presence. In our story, Mount Sinai trembled violently as God descended upon it. Clouds and lightning and thick darkness, smoke and fire form as God enters the scene. The same God that currently holds 7.5 billion people under his supervision and attentive eye was on Mount Sinai. He holds all life, all movement, and all time in the palm of his hand. There is no beginning without God. There is no end without God. The same God that names every star in the sky commands the sun, our sun, to move through space at 43,000 miles per hour. And he holds all of it under his care. That's the God that entered Mount Sinai. The universe is in the palm of his hand. And yet for a moment in time, he made his home on a mountain. And the entire mountain felt his presence. And as the only author of all life, matter, time, and reality, God is worthy of our reverence. And as we see in our story today, the Israelites got this memo in verse 16 of chapter 19 and in verses 18 through 21 of chapter 20, the people were afraid. They trembled with fear at the sight and the presence of God. And not only did they tremble, but they also said, whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on here? They backed off. They were at the foot of the mountain, but then the Bible says that they are now far off. Why did the Israelites back up? It's because they were smart enough to recognize, to recognize that if God is doing this to a mountain, what on earth is he going to do to me if I get too close to this mountain? And so they stayed at a distance. And so in many ways, this separation of themselves was uh, their way of showing their reverence for God. I believe that one area that the church has allowed to wane in its importance is the area of reverence for God. To revere something is to have reverence for someone. Um, to revere or have reverence for someone means to have deep respect or admiration for someone or something. When you genuinely revere somebody, when you genuinely um, um, respect uh, them and, and revere them, you respect them for all of who they are. 
The Israelites revered God for the awesome power that he displayed at Mount Sinai. They revered him for the mercy he showed them um, because he entered the scene and he didn't kill them, but instead he made a covenant with them. And they revered him for the glory that they got, they got to see and witness and live to tell about. They revered him for all of these different things. People knew that God was and, and is so amazing and so awesome that his presence alone is enough to kill somebody. Yet the Israelites revered God because he had shown them a portion of who he really was and let them live. Many of us in church lack reverence for God because we don't understand who God is. It's easy to minimize uh, someone or something when you don't really know what you're dealing with. Our reverence for God often stops at our level of acceptance of who God is. If you only see God as your friend, then you will only expect to give him, your, uh, give him you, you will only expect for him to give you wisdom, to give you companionship, but never give you any command. If you only see God as a God who judges, then most, if not all, of your conversations will revolve around who is and who is not going to hell. If you only see God as your business partner, then you will only look to him as someone who helps your dreams and your vision and your bank account come to pass and rarely look to him as the supreme king and ruler of his advancing kingdom. Yes, God is our friend. Yes, God is the judge. Yes, God is our father. But he's also God, the author and sustainer of life. And that includes my life and yours. If we only see God for a part of who he is and not the totality of who he is, then we will not revere him as we should. Instead of us trying to keep God in his proper place, we will often try to bring him down to our level. We will try to make our one of a kind God common. We'll try to add him to our lives like he is an accessory when God is the supreme jewel of all of existence. God is a necessity, not an accessory. We should build our lives around him or we should just leave him alone. Anything else would be irreverence towards him. We make God casual when we should be taking him seriously. We go to church when we feel like going to church. We pray when we feel like praying. We read our Bible when we feel like reading our Bibles. But if the mountain quakes at the presence of God, if the atmosphere changes into thunder and lightning and fire when he enters the scene because of his presence, how should we respond to him in our lives? What should we do? Simply put, we should live in a constant state of reverence towards God. Not uptightness, not rigidity, not legalism, not religion, but simply, not, not, not even just tradition. We just simply need to revere him. We should live with deep respect or, and ad adoration for God as God. He is our father. He is our friend, but he is also the God of all creation. And we need to live in a constant state of reverence towards God instead of trying to always consistently bring him down to us and make the God of, the, uh, of heaven and earth, the God of all creation, casual and common. This is why this message is entitled, Hallowed Be Thy Name. Hallowed Be thy name. If we go back to our story, we see that the Israelites showed reverence to God by consecrating themselves. They cleaned themselves up symbolically. Um, they made sure they looked nice. It's like, how would you dress if you knew you were going to meet the president? Like, what would you wear? It was the same thing, like, oh, we're about to go meet God. I need to make sure that I am looking my best. And this is why people back in the day, we used to have what was called our Sunday best. We would always wear a shirt and tie because Symbolically speaking, we were about to go and meet God, so we might as well look our best. And this is what the Israelites did. And this showed that they trusted God's word and Moses' word because God said, I'm going to meet y'all on the third day. So they prepared themselves to meet God on the third day. They revered God by showing that he is worthy of being listened to and waited on. But they also recognized that they were in the presence of God, and this showed how they uh, revered God. 
um, um, they saw the smoke and they saw the fire and they trembled at the presence of God. And in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 20 through, through 29, Moses gives us a little bit of commentary and background to this uh, event at the foot of Mount Sinai. It says, and when you heard the voice of the Lord out of verse 23, when you heard the voice of the Lord out of darkness, while the mountain was ablaze with fire, all the leaders of your tribes and your elders came to me. And you said, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his majesty. And we heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them. But now why should we die? This great fire will consume us and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of a fire as we have and survived? Go near and listen to all that the Lord has, our God says. Then tell us whatever the Lord our God com uh, tells you. We will listen and obey. Moses says that the Lord heard when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard what the people, this people said to you. Everything they said was good. Everything they said was good. It was good for them to revere. It was good for them to be afraid and tremble. And then in verse 29, God says, Oh, that their hearts would uh, be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. They revered God as the God of all creation and separated themselves from him. But even though this distance was good, this was not God's ultimate plan for Israel and for humanity. We must revere God as God, but our reverence should not stop there. In John chapter 13, verse 23, during the Last Supper, we see G Jesus, God wrapped in flesh with the Apostle John, reclining at his side. Here we see such a wonderful example of God not wanting his people to be far off, but to be in a close, meaningful relationship with him. One of the apostles is right next to God wrapped in flesh, and it's okay. Acts 1 and 2 are a continuation of God wanting us to be close to him. It was right for the Israelites to tremble at God's presence, but it was also right for John to recline next to Jesus. Both are real and helpful depictions of God. And in Acts chapter 2, uh, in Acts chapters 1 and 2, Jesus ascends to heaven on a cloud. But before he ascends, he commands the disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promised Holy Spirit. John baptized with water, but the disciples would be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. He would baptize them with the Holy Spirit. And here the disciples show their reverence for Jesus by taking him seriously and obeying him. They went to Jerusalem and they waited on him and they waited on God to fulfill his promise to them. And after 10 days of waiting, Jesus fulfilled his promise and baptized them with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, that represented the fulfillment of God's promise and God's desire to be intimate and united with his people. When the Holy Spirit came and filled the room where the disciples were staying, he also filled the disciples. Now God no longer needed to descend on a mountain and have a mountain be the temple where he stayed. He no longer had to make the mountains his dwelling place. He could now make people his dwelling the death of Jesus cleansed this temple and our bodies from the guilt and from the stain of sin so that the Holy Spirit could fill this new temple and we could be God's new dwelling place. If you could put a spiritual x-ray over our stomachs right now, you just had a spiritual x-ray and was able just to see inside of us that in every, inside of every born again believer all over the world, that same smoke, that same fire, that same lightning, that same power, all of that that descended on Mount Sinai would be right here inside of us. That same power that was working on Mount Sinai, causing it to tremble, would be right here inside of us. What a mountain could barely contain is now contained in us. 
This shows the infinite knowledge of God. Because oh, only God could have the insight and the foresight to devise a plan 1,500 years in the making and bring it to pass at just the right time. This shows how God can be omnipresent because that God who descended on Mount Sinai now lives in me and in Vaughn and in Kesha and in Pastor Jasper and in every born-again, blood-bought believer all over the world. He's always with us. This shows the amazing wisdom of God because only God can know how to contain all of his splendor, all of his glory, all of his majesty, all of his power, all of his knowledge, all of his care, all of his love, all of his mercy inside of me and you. This shows how faithful God is because God gave a promise to Abraham that all nations would be blessed through him. And we see that that through his grandchildren at Mount Sinai, uh, this started to happen. We see that on the day of Pentecost, this was fulfilled. And we see that this promise to Abraham that all nations would be blessed continues in me and in you. Because Abraham believed in God, we're all blessed today. And this shows the absolutely, utterly amazing love of God, the love that he has for his people. He could have easily made people to be out his, be his slaves and just serve him from a place of slavery. And God would have been justified in doing that. But God filling us with his Holy Spirit shows us that we aren't just slaves. We are his redeemed partners in stewarding this world. God wants us to participate with him. What better way could God say, I am with you than living inside of you? What better way could God say, you are not alone than him living inside of you? What better way for him to say, I care about you than him being always right there with you? In spite of all the lies that we've told, in spite of all the rebellion and disobedience that we've walked in, in spite of all the cheating that we've done, in spite of the depression that has bound us, in spite of the mistakes that we have made in our lives, in spite of all the broken relationships that we have participated in, God looked down at us and all the mess, all the mire, all the muck and all the mud has still found a way to see something precious and redeemable. Your life matters to God because he died for you. He loved us, died in our place, cleaned us up, and now makes his home in us. What an amazing, mind-blowing reality, fact of reality that God is making his home in me and in you. If the mountain could barely contain him, if the smoke and the fire and the power of God made the mountain tremble, yet somehow, some way, he says, I want you. That should draw us to a place of reverence. If God living in us does not display the amazing love for us and the amazing amount of care that God has for us, I I don't know what else he could do. I got I got nothing else. There is no God as wise, as faithful, as powerful, as loving, as merciful as our God. And this should bring us to our knees in reverence and jumping off of our feet in joy because he saved and loved and delivered us from all the bondage of sin, hell and darkness that we were once a part of. This is the God who redeems and saves and is worthy of our reverence. But, but, (laughs) Pentecost has some unintended consequences. Now that we no longer have to wash our clothes and walk 15 miles to a mountain and do all this stuff and sacrifice a whole bunch of lambs and cut up a whole bunch of bulls in order to meet with God and sacrifice to God, we don't have to travel to the foot of Mount Montesano every single Sunday, we started to get a bit irreverent. Now we can simply pray a prayer of repentance, make Jesus our Lord and Savior, and God will gladly come and live inside of us. And although the barrier to entry is still high, it is perceived as being low because it can potentially take no physical effort to meet God. Because access to God is perceived to be simple, Pray your prayer and make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Our reverence for God has waned over the years. 
Simple things often produce weak reverence. We have minimal reverence for the CEO who just started a business, but they have never sold a thing. But we've got a great amount of reverence for the CEO and for the billionaires who run huge companies and make a ton of money every single year. Why? Because it's simple to start a business, but it seems really, really hard to run a business at a billionaire level. Now, if there was a billionaire who created a system where everybody could be billionaires and then everybody became a billionaire, our reverence for billionaires would wane. Why would it wane? Because the thing that was once really, really difficult to obtain has now become commonplace. If everybody was a billionaire, then what reverence should we really give to it? And it's a similar thing with God. Now that anyone can have access to God, the Israelites were horrified because you were not supposed to be able to speak to God and live, and now God is speaking to people every single day about something that's going on. This, has, this is different than what they were used to. And we're unfamiliar with God being uh, so easily accessible to us. Now anyone can have access to God. And because of this, our reverence has waned. Because, because God has made himself available to anyone, we have unintentionally made our relationship with him common, place, and casual. Ease of access um, and God's nearness to us has turned into we go to church when we feel like going to church. We pray when we feel like praying. We read our Bible when we feel like reading our Bible because he's always there. We follow the Bible verses that are easy for us to follow, and we procrastinate, and we flip over all the ones that require some real work from us. But knowing these unintended consequences of the nearest nearness of God and our ease to access to God, I believe that this is what Jesus says in the first line of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus recognized that the number one thing that will keep reverence in our hearts for God is if we remember to keep his name hallowed. Now, what do I mean by hallowed? What does it mean to hallow something? Well, the word hallowed and the word sanctify and the word holy all carry the same connotation. Anybody have a grandmama who had a big china um, set or, or an aunt who had a big china set in the back? Anybody? Was I, was I the only one? Okay. Or what, does anybody have a special set of cups or a silverware that they use and they only use it for super, super special occasions? Now, you got a whole bunch of cups just littered in your house, plastic cups, styrofoam cups. You just throw those away whenever you feel like it. But that cup that you only use for special occasions, that cup is hallowed. That cup has been sanctified amongst all the other cups. It has been set apart. To be holy means that something is excellent. It is a cut above the rest. It is morally pure. It is utterly unique. And that cup that you only use once a year, that cup has been set apart. It is different than all those other weak little cups that got scratches and, and, and different little things on them. It's set apart. It's, it's, um, it's pure. You only got to clean that one once a year because you only use it once a year. The other ones you use it whenever you feel like using it. That's what it means for something to be sanctified. It's set apart. It's special. It's higher than everything else. And so if that's what it means to sanctify a cup or some china, what does it mean to sanctify God? Hallowed be thy name means that amongst all the other names, amongst all the other realities, amongst all the other people that are on this earth, that name has the highest authority and the highest amount of power, respect, and dignity in my life. I hollow that name. I set that name apart. That name is excellent. It's morally pure. It is like no other name. It is utterly unique. So I give it the attention it rightly deserves. That's what it means to hallow the name of God. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your name be higher than every other name. May your name be higher than depression, higher than doubt, higher than fear, higher than my status, higher than my own life, higher than my culture, higher than my family's life. Lord, let your name be great in my 
life. That's what it means to hallow, to sanctify the Lord God in your heart, to revere, to make his name holy. Holy, it's utterly unique, it's separated, it's different, it's excellent, it's morally pure. And if we keep the name of God hallowed in our hearts and in our prayers, everything else can be hallowed. This is why he started with hallowed be your name, because if you don't hallow his name, you will not seek first his kingdom. You will not seek first his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. You're not going to thank him for all the food that you have. But when you hollow his name, you can say, forgive me of my debt as we forgive others. Therefore, we need to make every effort we can to make sure that God, our Father, is hollowed in our lives. Because if we don't hollow his name, every other area in our life is going to suffer. But the inverse is true. When we hollow his name, every other area in our life is blessed. And what brings his name down? Irreverence. Commonplace and casual. As I'm wrapping up, three ways. I want to give us three ways that we Three ways to know if you are making God irreverent in your life. Obviously, there's a buttload of name, of ways, but I'm just going to focus on three today. Then I'm going to talk about four ways in which we can start back revering God in our lives. Excuse me. Three ways to know if you are walking in irrever- irreverence towards God. Number one, you make little to no effort to pray. When you make little to no effort to pray, that shows an irreverence towards God. And not just in frequency, but in method as well. I can't tell you how many people I meet who say, I pray all day, every day. I pray. I pray all the time. I pray all the time. But this is the question you need to ask yourself. If an onlooker was to look at your life over the last seven days, what would they say about your prayer life? If somebody else, if I was to look at Vaughn's prayer life, the Lord gave me access to the last seven days, what would I say about her prayer life? Because if you're only praying in your mind and in your heart, That shows little to no effort to hollow his name. Now, there's there's nothing wrong. There is a place for just praying in your heart. Our sister Hannah in Samuel chapter 1 shows us the power of praying in your heart. But when praying in your heart has become your lifestyle, that means that a level of irreverence has set in, and the name that was once hollowed is now commonplace. When we don't pray, when we don't make any effort to pray, There's value in seeing how the Israelites went to the mountain to pray. There's value in seeing that they had to dress themselves up to meet with God. There is is little to no effort when we just lay down and we just pray in our mind and and we call that good enough. We don't do that in any other relationship, but we find a way to do it with God. When we make little to no effort to pray, that shows irreverence. Number two, when we procrastinate on doing what God is leading us to do. When the word of God becomes trivial to you, when you can ignore it easily, easily, when you can wait one week or two weeks or three weeks to act on what God is saying, that shows a level of irreverence. Many of us have had mothers and fathers who, when they asked us to do something, we did it. And there have been plenty of times in our lives when they asked us to do something, I'm like, oh, I can't press pause, mama. I want to get through with this loving, mama. Give me three more days, mama. And that's how we responded to their cry. And we need to be the ones who take his name and his words serious. Number three, how do we know when irreverence has crept in? When sin is accepted. Most little sins and big sins. The white lie is just as irreverent as a big, hairy, gray, ugly lie. They're both as wicked. I don't know why calling a white lie white makes it less wicked. I don't know who told us that. I don't know changing the name of a sin does not uh, uh, remove its filth and its destructive power from the sin. The moment that we start accepting sin, lying, laziness, procrastinating, cheating, uh, um, fornication, whatever it may be, it does not matter the sin. Who cares? We're starting to walk in irreverence. And so four ways. Those are three ways. Now, four ways to walk in reverence towards God. Number one is first, when you want to start walking in reverence towards God, 
First, you just hallow his name. This is why the Lord's Prayer always starts with our Father with our in heaven. We have to remember all day, every day, to hallow his name. So declare, what does it mean to, how can we hallow his name? Start declaring who he is. Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are the one uh, uh, who saved my, uh, saved my soul. God, you're the one who descended on the mountain in fire and in smoke. Jesus, you are the great one. Jesus, you are the one who loves us. You are all powerful, all loving, all wise. You care for us. We're safe in your arms. We're safe with you. You are our shepherd. We just start to hallow his name. And as you do that, ask God, any irreverence, get it out of me. This is why one of the Ten Commandments is, do not take the name of your Lord God in vain. As you hallow your name, say, Lord, remove all vanity towards your name out of me. Every time we flippantly say God's name, we just throw his name out there. Every OMG, every time we do this, we are bringing his name down, making it commonplace. And this is why uh, uh, Satan uh, throws God's name as a cuss word because he's trying to get it to make it commonplace and filthy. He is trying to degrade God's name while we are trying to lift his name up. So don't give in to the temptation of just throwing God's name flippantly around because it's worthy of being revered. So when you hollow his name just simultaneously, if there is any irreverence towards me, towards you, Lord God, remove it. Number two, make an effort to pray. If you have an effort of, uh, if you have habits in prayer, find ways to make an effort. If you're used to laying down, find a way to get up and go to the bathroom, go to your first floor, go to your second floor, and move around. If you have a habit of, uh, of going to your bathroom, maybe go to your car, maybe drive to Mon Mount Montesano, whatever you got to do to symbolically say, God, you are worthy of me moving and making something happen, I encourage you to do it. Make an effort to pray. Make an effort to come to all the prayer meetings that we have. Make an effort to talk to God. Because he wants to hear what you have to say. He didn't die for you just for you to stay quiet. He died so that he could hear you and you could hear him. And that only happens in prayer. So I encourage you not just to lay down on the job, but remember that you are coming before the one in which all of heaven bows. Number three ways that we can walk in reverence towards God, remove and repent of all sin. If you know that you're walking in some kind of sin, just say, Lord, I want to change. Lord, help me to get right. Talk, come talk to a pastor or to a friend. Somebody, I'm sinning and struggling with this. Break it off of me. Help me get free from this. In Jesus' name. You want to hollow the name of God? God hates sin. It is an utter abomination to him. Every sin is an abomination to him because it devalues his name. It devalues his holiness. It devalues truth. So when we're walking around here as if sin is okay, it's irreverent. And I feel like I'm kind of yelling, y'all. Forgive me for, for, for yelling unnecessarily. But the point I'm trying to drive is that sin should not be tolerated. And when we get to the place where we start tolerating sin, we're walking in irreverence towards God. Be a bloodhound when it comes to sin in your life. Sniff it out and pull it out. And last but not least, move forward on any instructions you have received or what is falling? Oh, pins. It's weird. Move forward on any instructions you have received or ignored. If God has told you to do something, just move forward on it. He told you to stop doing something, just stop. I'm not worried about it if you pick it up later. Just stop right now. Just do it right now. If God is telling you to do something, just walk in that direction. Just go forward in whatever direction he's telling you to go. If he's telling you to start something, then start it. If he's telling you to do something, then do it. If he's telling you to stop being afraid about something, say, God, help me to stop being afraid about whatever it is. If God is telling you to do something, do not procrastinate on it. So if I were to summarize all of these ways. You could walk in reverence towards God. You could kind of treat it like it was something that you could do on a consistent or continual basis. Our reverence for God can grow. We can get better at reverence towards God. So I came up with a little acronym called HERM. Just remember your favorite HERM whenever you want to walk in reverence towards God. 
It might be Herm, Ever Herm Edwards, Herman Monster, Herm Babe Ruth, but her just remember your favorite Herm. H stands for hollowed, Herm. E stands for uh, make an effort to pray. R stands for repent and remove sin. And then M stands for move forward. If you remember Herm, you can remember, I can walk in reverence towards God. And so I want to conclude by just saying this. I want to remind us that although the entire Bible is filled with people who struggle to properly revere God, it's also filled with people who adequately revere God. In Exodus chapters 20, at chapters 19 and 20, Israel did a great job of properly revering God. But just a few chapters later, they were building and worshiping a golden calf. And in Acts chapter 2, 1 and 2, we see the early disciples taking God seriously by doing what he commanded them to do. But just a few chapters later, we see two disciples irreverently lie towards God, and then within a few seconds, they are dead because of their irreverence. Why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because not even an experience with God can make you revere him forever. At the end of the day, there will come a point in your life where you have to decide for yourself that I will walk in reverence towards God all the days of my life, and I'm not looking back. No matter how much the mountains tremble, and no matter how powerful a person's encounter with the Holy Spirit was, all experiences one day wane. And if you are banking on your experiences to keep you in reverence towards God, I'm here to tell you today that experiences will only take you so far. Experiences with God are amazing, but every believer should have a, ha, should, and every believer should have a physical encounter with God. But you must know that experiences have a shelf life. Experiences are, with God are meant to help you stay committed to God. But experiences can never make you stay committed to God. They can never make the commitment for you. It was good for the Israelites to have a physical encounter with God, but the encounter only lasted so long. It was good for them, but it only lasted so long. I encourage you to value experiences uh, with God. It value when he speaks to you, when he touches you, when he encounters you. But more important than the experience, I encourage you to make the commitment to revere God in your heart. Hallow his name, saints. Because the cost of walking with God, the cost of walking in reverence towards God is your life. But the benefit of walking in reverence towards God is a greater life in return. It's a life transformed by the redeeming love of God Almighty, able to walk faithfully with Him. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name.